Hey, what's going on folks? It's Mike here and welcome to the next lesson in the concurrency series. In this lesson, I want to talk about another type of lock that's available called a try lock. So let's go ahead and investigate. So what I'm going to go ahead and do from the CPP reference page is just go ahead and search for new text or click on it in the bottom right corner in our concurrency support, which is something that's available since C++11. So let's go ahead and click on this link here. And just to refresh a little bit about what locks are, the basic idea is any time where I have a program that is running and I have some thread that's executing, for example, here's some thread, here might be some section of code that I want to protect. So I'm trying to protect this code or region of code, meaning that if another thread is trying to come in here, it will be blocked here. And our basic mechanism for doing that was something known as a mutex. So I can just draw a little lock here and a little unlock here. So once one of these threads here, say thread one is done with the lock, it can release it as illustrated here. And then the next thread, thread two, can enter whatever this code happens to be and access any shared resources. Again, that is the overall goal of using a lock. And again, a specific locking mechanism is a mutex, which just locks or unlocks. Sometimes we refer to it as a binary semaphore. Now, if we go ahead and look at the web page for mutex, we'll see that, well, a calling thread owns a mutex and it can either lock or this other thing called try lock to acquire that lock, that is to be able to protect some resources. Now, so far in this series, we haven't looked at a try lock, so let's go ahead and investigate what exactly this is. And the basic idea here with a try lock is, well, in the first sentence, we try to lock the mutex. And depending on the result, we'll get a Boolean value here and return immediately. So that means we'll either try to acquire the lock, and then if we can, we will well, as illustrated, execute this section of code. And in the case that we cannot acquire the lock because some other thread has obtained this one lock, this one resource, then instead of just waiting here to acquire the lock, we will instead just go around this code and continue on with our lives. So maybe there's nothing else for this thread to do, or maybe it goes and executes some other piece of code. Okay, so that's the idea with a try lock. You try to acquire a resource, and otherwise, if you cannot, you just continue on with your life. You can think about this in the real world as, say, if you are walking to a store, and maybe there is a uh, ATM machine, and somebody's using this. Well, you say, well, I'll just continue. I don't want to wait. I'll go do my groceries or whatever. Versus a regular lock, you would wait in line and just keep checking your watch and saying, hey, is it my time yet? Is it my time yet? And looking at the ATM machine to see if you can acquire that resource. Okay, so that's the idea. Let's go ahead and look at an example and code it up here to refresh our concurrency skills here. And then we'll finish up with talking about why you might want to use one of these locks here. So I have a sample here from the CPP reference. I'm going to modify it just a little bit to make it a little bit more explicit, but let's go ahead and uh, begin here. So what we're going to want to do first is create some sort of mutex here. And usually this is some sort of global lock here. So we'll create something like this here. Now, what I'm going to go ahead and do is create two different threads here. So as a reminder, how do we do that in C++? We use standard thread here, and I'll just call it uh, thread one. And that's just going to execute. So it's first argument job one. And we'll repeat the same thing for a second thread here. So let's go ahead and copy and paste this here. And this will be thread two and job two. And we need to remember to join our threads here. So we'll join each of thread one and thread two here. Okay, and let's just go ahead for sake of refreshing ourselves. We'll just pronounce job one. And we'll do the same thing with job two. And then we'll go ahead and compile. So G++ is what I'm going to use. C++ 17, because we need to use some sort of modern version of C++ 11 or beyond. 
our program output and well remember the other thing we need to do so as soon as i hit enter we're going to get a little bit of an error here because we didn't link in our library here so link in the pthread library if you're on linux for instance okay so i can go ahead and run this program and it'll run no deterministic order including how each of these individual characters are printed out uh, but that's not what we're worried about right now right now we want to work with the actual mutex and do this sort of trilog thing Okay, so what's the idea here? Well, in this case, what I want this program to do is just do one of two jobs. Maybe in this instance, or a use case here, is we're trying to randomize things. So whether or not job one is printed out or job two is just sort of non-deterministic. We can see that job one sometimes happens first and sometimes job two does and so on. But I want to write a program where only one of these two things will actually happen or can happen. So that may be one case where you try to use this lock here. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is use mutoc, mutex here. And instead of lock here, like we'd usually do, I'm just going to put try lock here. And that's how I'm going to uh, write this program here. And I'm going to say, if I'm able to acquire this lock here, then print out job one is executed. Now, I also need to make sure that if this particular piece of code is executed, that I release this lock here. So I need to do mutex on lock here. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and repeat this same code here. Essentially, uh, the same block of code here and do a uh, unlock here and I'll just say job two is executed. All right, so let's go ahead and see what happens. And I'm just going to clear up some space here just so you can see the entirety of the program here, <laughs> just to refresh what's going on here. So I'll go ahead and recompile here and um, oops, this should be called uh, not mutex, but uh, glock because that's what we're actually using here. So again, maybe you spotted this error before I did here. So I'll change mutex to our global lock. And let's go ahead and give this a try here. And it compiles and let's run. And in this case, well, it looks like both threads were launched here. Both were trying to execute, but at a given time, only job one could obtain the lock. So let's go ahead and run this a few more times just to see what happens. All right, and I'll run this job one, job one, tends to win. Now, this was a little bit of a weird case here. Job one is executed and job two is executed. So what happened here? Well, what must have happened is job one obtained the lock and was able to execute and then unlock by the time job two was able to uh, be spawned here at line 24 and start to execute. So we can still see that we have some sort of interesting behavior here. So let's go ahead and just try to mix things up and perhaps try to instead have some other behaviors that happen here. Okay, so in this case, what I want to do is I'm just going to say that job one always has to execute. So I'm always going to try to acquire the lock here. And I'm always going to remember to unlock. And again, just when I'm writing concurrent code, I'm always going to uh, or I like to stylistically indent where the locks are, so I have unlocks. And even better, if you're using modern C++, we should be using a lock guard as well. So let's just go ahead and execute this program here. Let's see what sort of behavior we get, and make sure I save. And I'll run it, and in this case, we see that job 2 tried to acquire the lock. It was able to, and then job 1 is executed here. And I'll go ahead and run it. In this case, job one is executed. It must have finished in the time that job two tried to acquire the lock. And in this instance, well, only job one was executed. Maybe job two tried to acquire the lock first, but was unable to. So hopefully you're just getting a feel for what try lock is. But again, where do we pragmatically want to actually use this lock? Well, Here's a particular instance where we might want to. And I'm going to try to sketch this out because this could be some sort of uh, pattern that you might want to use in your programs, for instance. So let me go ahead and clear up our drawing board here. And basically the idea is what if I had some sort of thread here that was producing some data? So sometimes we call this a producer consumer model. I'm just going to uh, say we have a bunch of threads that are producing 
uh, data here. Producer three and so on. And their job is to perhaps generate some integer. So generate some data and we have to put it somewhere. Now we have some sort of queue here where we want to put data. So maybe producer one has the goal of just producing some data with ones, producer two, twos, and three. Now, this data structure here is what is actually shared. So maybe each of these producers, what they're trying to do is generate some data, put this data into the queue, but there has to be some sort of lock on this particular uh, data structure here, which is usually some sort of queue or maybe a vector in C++. So we have a lock unlock mechanism here. And what we might want to do is have each of our producers try to obtain the lock here. And if they fail, maybe they wait and then they try again with their goal of being able to queue up their data in whatever order that it might happen to appear in here. So you could get some sort of totally random order based off of what the producers are doing. And then in the meantime, you could have other consumer threads. So maybe some consumer over here in its box that's just trying to read the last entry and do something with that information. So that could be an instance depending on how you want to structure this problem where you use a try lock. You could just use a regular lock that says, hey, only one thing at a time can be happening here. But maybe if the producer tries to queue up some data here, maybe it can do something else. So let's go ahead and modify our code here just to show this instance here where if our job two does not successfully obtain the lock, maybe it goes and does something else. And that could be that it waits for a while. So for instance, we could just have this thread sleep where we go ahead and just say this thread uh, sleeps for, um, I don't know, five seconds or something. And then maybe we repeat this code here. Now this is a little bit uh, ugly code here, but we could just say um, if lock try lock again, and then we would have to uh, unlock our thread. And let's go ahead and say job two executed on second try. Okay, something like that. I'll just put an end line here so everything fits nicely on the screen. Um, and I'll need to include the uh, chrono library for this uh, particular function. So let's include chrono here. And let's give that another try. And ah, I'll have to be a little bit more um, specific here. Let me go ahead and include um, something like this. Um, using namespace standard chrono uh, literals. And then I can do something like five seconds here. Let's go ahead and see if that does it. That does the trick. And let me bring out my cheat sheet here. I just searched for sleep four and then using namespace chrono literals here. And you could do something like 2000 milliseconds, five seconds or whatever. Um, and by using this using namespace here, the scope is just within these curly braces. Okay, so anyway, that's just a little aside here. Program compiles, and again, the functionality here is this job that we always want to happen, so it's always going to wait for a lock, will try to happen here. So if it happens to obtain the lock first, it'll execute. Otherwise, if job two happens to get the lock, it'll execute. But in the instance that job one gets to go first, then, well, job two might try and fail, and then otherwise it'll wait for five seconds and try again. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this a few times. So in this instance, our try lock is executed. So job two, execute the first time. Job two again the first time. Job one the first time. Uh, looks like we got lucky here. And looks like job two um, also executed here. Now, in this uh, instance here, we didn't notice the delay. Now, this time we did uh, because 
again, because of the non-determinism of concurrency, job one might have just happened to finish before job two even tried to obtain the lock. Okay, so that was okay. But in this latest round, we see that job two uh, executed, with a little bit of a spelling mistake here, uh, executed uh, on the second try. So let's run this a few more times because I think that'll be a common case. So here, job one has executed. We tried to obtain the lock, wasn't available. We wait five seconds and then we try again. So I could again imagine this is a scenario where we have some data that we're processing and we want to try to again process that data, maybe in a infinite loop or something instead of just trying once here. That might be interesting. But this is also could be interesting if I was setting up the logic in a game, for instance. And you could imagine that there's some sort of scenario with artificial intelligence where there's different jobs trying to simulate what that intelligence is doing. And you might try one type of job and then maybe try another and then maybe try it again or something. But hopefully you have the idea down of what a try lock is actually doing. This idea that you can try to obtain a mutex, and if it fails, that's okay. You aren't waiting or busy waiting the whole time. So I hope this is an interesting lesson in concurrency, another use case of how to use try locks, for instance. And actually, before I uh, totally uh, leave us here, I want to go ahead and bring us back just for one second here. Because for folks who maybe have been watching the full series, you might have been saying, well, Mike, weren't we trying to benefit from RAII techniques? Because this looks like we could still try to obtain a lock and forget to unlock it. And I'm going to go ahead and um, search here um, for adopt lock, which I think could be something uh, useful for you to see here, where you could use a lock guard. Uh, let me actually find adopt uh, lock here. And Basically, this is something that you can use with a lock guard here <laughs> and just um, for your actual uh, mutex, then you can adopt it so you don't uh, forget about it. So the basic procedure would be uh, you create your lock guard with your mutex and this will always go out of uh, scope here for you properly. And you can try to adopt the lock if you acquire it. So the basic uh, idea here. Um, in our actual code here it would be, um, for instance, in our try lock here, you could create a lock guard and adopt the particular lock and then not have to worry about unlocking, especially if you have sort of this sort of if else and conditions. This could potentially be a code smell, though, if you see lots of nested if else's and then more if else's trying to obtain locks. So I hope that's clear that this is just an example. And if you're nesting more than say one time here, so one more if uh, with an if like here, that might be something you want to think about for your concurrency design. Perfectly fine example for learning about try lock, but again, be a little bit careful when using locks. Rely on RAII where possible, or consider if it's the right solution to be using in the first place. So with that said here, I'll actually end things. Hope you folks enjoyed this new lesson in the concurrency series. To make sure that you don't miss out on other lessons in concurrency or just doing threaded programming, uh, make sure that you like and subscribe the video to so show your support for the channel and be able to catch the next videos that show up. So hope this was useful. Hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you in the next one.